Hi everybody, my name is Dave Gray and uh, I've been working on a book, Liminal Thinking. I want to start with the, uh, the ancient story of the blind men and the elephant. You know the story. So there's an elephant. The story is that uh, the king brings the blind man into the palace from uh, all across the city. Then he has an elephant brought in and he asks the blind man to describe the elephant. The blind men, of course, get into big argument. You know, one, uh, one of them's touching the trunk, another one's touching the tail, someone's touching the side, and they can't agree, right? The uh, one is saying that uh, it's a wall, and this guy over here is saying, oh, it's a snake, it's like a snake, and this guy's saying, no, it's a rope, and uh, someone is touching the ear, he says, no, no, it's a fan. So what's the point of this story? We've heard it many times. The point of the story, I mean, the, the elephant is reality, and the point of the story is that we're all blind. We all seeing aspects of reality, and uh, we are we're not able to agree because we are seeing each of us is seeing a truth, a piece of the truth. In fact, all of these blind men are, are saying things that they believe are true, but none of them has the whole truth. The world elephant is this ancient, another ancient idea that we're all the whole world is the back of a giant elephant. But the back of the elephant, the, the world, let's just call this uh, reality. Okay, the elephant is reality. But the elephant, the reality is also unknowable. We could also call this the unknowable. None of us has the whole truth. All of us have just a piece of it. And here's how that works. Each of us has our own experiences and observations of uh, things that we, get, we uh, experience in the world, right? We observe things, we experience things, and those experiences are going to be different. They're going to be generally pretty local. So we have these experiences. And from those experiences, we select, we notice those things that are relevant to us. We can't notice anything, everything. Our brains just aren't powerful enough. We only notice those things that are relevant, uh, usually the things that are relevant to our specific needs. And then from those things that are relevant, we make assumptions. And from those assumptions, we draw conclusions. And from those conclusions, we form beliefs. And by belief, I mean everything you think you know. Everything you know is a belief. Here we are, standing up at the top here, and uh, we easily get confused. We're standing on top of this pyramid that we constructed, but actually, we think we're on the ground. So we have this imaginary ground, and we think our beliefs, these things that we know, are reality. And even though I say, when I say the word elephant, we talk about the blind men and the elephant, and uh, you have this picture of an elephant in your head, you don't actually believe that you have an elephant in your head, inside of your skull, do you? Um, but we act as if we do. We act as if our idea of the elephant, as if it was a snake or a fan or a wall or a rope, we act as if and, and, and operate as if that this is the only truth. Uh, our truth is the only truth. And so what's up here? Now down here we have the unknowable, right? Up here we have the obvious. What is the obvious? The obvious is the, that set of things that we never question because we believe them to be true. And we, have a, we form kind of a bubble around this obviousness. And we include those people who tend to agree. Usually there are people who tend to have similar experiences to us. Maybe they grew up in a similar environment. We create this bubble. And we, uh, this bubble is kind of confirmed over and over again by a kind of self-sealing logic that's rarely tested. It's my picture of self-sealing logic. What do I mean by self-sealing logic? All right. Uh, there was some study done about the Iraq War. The, uh, the pr purpose of going into the Iraq, Iraq War was stated by the, uh, by the administration as to uh, stop Saddam Hussein because he had weapons of mass destruction. I did a study asking people after the fact, even after it was very clear that there were no weapons of mass destruction, why people thought that we went. And uh, lo and behold, one of the, the sort of the way that people described it was things like, well, if, if we went there, we must have had a reason. There must have been a reason. And so we, we start with, often we'll start with conclusions. If we went there, there must have been a reason. And this has been demonstrated by over and over and over by uh, empirically, by... Uh, researchers 
that we start with the conclusions that we want to believe, the things that we want to believe, supporting the people that are on our team or, and so on, and then we work backward to uh, construct conclusions, to con construct a rationale. And that rationale might uh, take any number of forms, but in the end, it's self-sealing, self-sealing logic. So let's say this is uh, let's say you grew up in a in a Christian country here. Your experiences are mostly Christian. Now let's take someone over here, grew up in a Muslim country. You think their pyramid's going to be different? Well, certainly they're going to have different experiences and observations. They're going to different different needs, so they're going to have different things that are going to be relevant out of that experience. Probably different assumptions, different conclusions, different beliefs. They're going to have the same problem, though. They're going to have different a different bubble and a different set of obvious things. Now what happens? Now with the globalization and the internet, and Facebook, and this that kind of thing, these worlds are colliding more and more. They have different self-sealing logic, right? But this isn't something that just some people do. This is something that all people do. We all do this. We have a set of beliefs that uh, we cling to. Uh, we have self-sealing logic that we use to defend it. There's a guy named Chris Argyris calls this organizational defensive routines. And I got the word self-sealing logic from him also. He also has something that he calls the ladder of inference, which is what I've started drawing here in the pyramid. Ladder of inference. It's how we get there. So what happens? Well, you get this kind of these kind of culture wars, right? People, you know, s s saying uh, that there's a problem here and there, same here. And actually, sometimes we even get real wars, right? How do we solve this problem? How do we move these pieces closer to each other? There's only one way. First thing is, you want we could talk a little bit about how this self sealing logic works. What happens is, there's two ways that we make sense of new ideas. One is, here's let's say here's a new idea, okay? Some new idea, somebody's, we don't know what kind of, what pyramid they're on, right? Maybe they have some shared experiences with uh, us. Maybe not. We meet them on a, in an airport or something, or we're on Facebook. They have a new idea. How do we make sense of a new idea? Well, first thing is we look for internal coherence. Does it make sense with what we already know? So one is internal coherence. Does it fit with what we already believe? Well, if it fits with what we already believe, well, we'll have a tendency to accept it. What's number two? External validity. That means can we test it? If I take this idea and I try it and I test it out, will it work? The problem is that if an idea doesn't have internal coherence, if, it's, if it's, it doesn't already resonate with what you already know and what you already think is obvious, it's going to bounce off of here. You never, it's going to be immediately rejected. So we reject those things that do not have internal coherence. So you know a lot of the ideas from over here are going to just bounce back. They'll be rejected and vice versa. And this is where we get escalating conflict. Now, if you are going to reject an idea because it doesn't have internal coherence, you're probably not going to test it for external validity. Even though an idea that's coming from outside is the most likely to be the kind of idea that might lead you to expand or change your beliefs. Um, you have this bubble of self-sealing logic that protects you from any new idea that's going to, that's going to challenge or change your beliefs. This is a protective bubble. Why? Because what's in here feels safe. We like certainty. We like safety. This makes what we do, what this bubble is actually doing, is it's outsourcing, outsourcing all the fog and fear that comes with actual, actually dealing with reality, right? Thing, reality is uncertain. In fact, even the ground is moving under our feet all the time, very, very slowly. And, you know, as we know, I mean, I've started out in the newspaper industry, you know, things Things change. The world changes. You know, nothing stays certain forever. Nothing remains the same forever. Everything changes. Uh, many of my friends who are in the newspaper industry have been there for 30 years, knowing that the industry was in trouble and still not leaving, not doing anything about it, except staying inside the bubble, continuing to use the, the self-sealing logic to kind of protect themselves from this uncertain and if, just to feel safe. Now, the problem is that... Uh, we're, so we have this self-sealing logic protecting us from new ideas, protecting our beliefs from uh, any change. And those things that, the only things that we actually test for external validity are the things that actually make it through this. So the, we only test things for validity if they, if they already are internally coherent. You see how this kind of creates a self-sealing bubble that uh, could be dangerous over the long term? Now think of it this way. The... Uh, the fewer experiences you have, the narrower your pyramid, the narrower your set of, uh, the narrower your experiences. Let's say you grew up in the same, t in one town, never left the town, 
grew up with the same group of people, uh, your experiences, your relevant, your needs, your assumptions, your conclusions, your beliefs are going to be just probably equally narrow. You're not going to be able to expand them beyond your experiences very easily. Now, this is going to feel that being in a space like this, the narrower it is, uh, in some ways, the safer it feels. And the more of these things outside of here feel scary and dark. However, you know, the wider a pyramid is, the safer it is. Um, now, so the idea is that to most of us, this, this stuff that's going on in here, this is all unconscious. This is kind of underwater. All this construction of belief is not something we do consciously. It's something we do unconsciously. Now, how do, you, how do we solve this problem? We're arguing, you know, people arguing, problems, conflict, what have you. How do we solve this problem? Well, one way is to actually make this process conscious, to understand how you go about constructing your beliefs. Take a flashlight and peer down in there and to start to, start to walk down there. Start to deconstruct your own pyramid. Why do I believe this? What are the conclusions that I made? What are the assumptions that I made? What are the things that I were relevant. What are my needs and why were the certain kinds of experiences things that I thought were relevant? Then we can start walking over here and start walking up other people's systems. Now, to do that, we have to find a way to, number one, deconstruct our own beliefs, and number two, understand other people's beliefs and how they came to them. doesn't mean we have to agree, but it does mean we have to step outside of our bubble for a minute. How do you do that? Number one, you have to suspend judgment, suspend disbelief. People act in ways and talk in ways that make sense to them. So if, if you're hearing someone, if something makes sense to them and it doesn't make sense to you, then you're missing something, right? So you got to start asking yourself, what would I have to believe in order to think that? This is, uh, I've got more to say on this and I'll say more over time, but this is the start of something that I'm calling liminal thinking. Liminal is a Latin word for threshold and liminal thinking is a skill that I think is going to be increasingly important for leaders and more and more and more of these worlds start to collide. Liminal thinking is a way of connecting people and connecting ideas and expanding our ways of understanding the world so we can see better and communicate better. I hope you enjoyed this and we'll talk soon.